me uh, draw your pleasant lunch to an end and move on to the, the reason you all came, other than the food. I'm David Leighton Brown. I'm the master of McLaughlin College. Uh, my usual organizational comment for any students in the room, if you have not already signed in at the register at the back, please do. The reason is because we want to give you a certificate of participation, uh, which you will get if you attend six or more of these lunch talks. Uh, and we will only know if you've done that if you've signed in six or more times. So please uh, do that before you leave. This is uh, a part of a series of talks uh, organized uh, in collaboration between McLaughlin College and the Department of Political Science here at York University, uh, leading up to and following this election. As I've said before, a federal election is a once in a student's lifetime event, not literally in your entire life, but in your time as a student. There should be only one election during that period of time. One of the things we might talk about is whether that's a reasonable assumption under the, the current uh, circumstances. And for a college devoted to the analysis and critical understanding of public policy and a department devoted to the analysis and critical understanding of politics, this is uh, an opportunity we could not let slip by. And so I'm delighted we have uh, offered this series. I'm delighted you all are, are here to, uh, to take part in it. So without any further ado, I will turn the microphone over to the chair of the Department of Political Science, David Newman, who probably wants to do something technical before he starts talking. Well, only to stick that on so that I don't have to hold it. So. Right. Um, thank you very much, David, and, uh, and thank you all for coming. As, uh, as David said, I'm David Mutimer. I'm the chair of the Department of Political Science. Um, let me say a few things about the series, about why we're doing this, and then a few things about the particular focus of, uh, of today's discussion. Um, as David says, we have uh, an election coming up. Um, and uh, Canadian elections have been faced with declining participation over the last number of years. Uh, it seemed to us that this is a tremendous opportunity for students and uh, for colleagues as well, but uh, for students to become involved. It's often if you're, um, uh, bye. Oh well. Sorry, we have lectures. <laughs> um, it, the, this is uh, a, sort of a once in your university experience opportunity, and we want to make sure that you are as well informed about both the election and the process of election, and what comes after it, as you can be. Um, I, democracy is tremendously important. It's something that's been struggled for over hundreds of years, um, and continues to be struggled for. I mean, these are simply images that I've pulled from the most recent uh, democratic, violent democratic struggles um, over the past few years, the Arab Spring, um, with people taking to the streets and risking themselves for the kinds of things that we're going to have the opportunity to do over the next two weeks. Um, and of course, we also see just exactly how wrong that can go if we don't uh, continue to struggle for it. We currently are facing, um, or at least our European friends, are facing um, uh, a, an influx of refugees fleeing the violence in Syria. There's been violence in, uh, in Iraq. There was violence in um, Egypt responding to the call in all three cases, in part at least, for greater democratic participation um, in government. And so I think it's important that we understand how precious and how fragile the democracy that we get to participate in over the next couple of weeks is as we choose whether or not to get out to vote. Um, but that's just the moral suasion, right? They, they, you know, they, the democracy is uh, uh, made up of a variety of things, the rule of law, a series of freedoms, rooted in an electoral process that gives us the opportunity 
to, uh, to have a say in our own government. And it's that that we want to focus on. Um, on how you vote, how you can choose how to vote, and today in particular about what happens once you vote, uh, what happens to connect our um, uh, electoral participation with the government that follows. And part of the spur of this, for me, uh, was the 2008 election and what happened after it. And you may well remember that in 2008, we faced a situation that we may well face again in a couple of weeks' time, which is an election that didn't produce a majority in Parliament. Rather, um, no single party had more seats than all the others combined. Um, as was perfectly reasonable, the sitting Prime Minister, uh, still sitting Prime Minister, but the sitting Prime Minister at the time, Stephen Harper, um, was offered the first chance to form a government. He also had the largest number of seats, although still not a majority. He formed a government. He brought that government and its program to the, uh, the House. He introduced a fiscal update within the first few days of the parliamentary session. And it was such um, a, a, a politically problematic uh, uh, program that the other three leading members, uh, parties in the House, um, determined that they would no longer provide support for that government. And the Liberals and NDP entered into a coalition agreement. Um, the Bloc Québécois agreed to provide support, supply support. In other words, they, allowed, they would allow this coalition government to spend money for two years um, in order to uh, change the government in Canada. What followed is one of the more remarkable moments in Canadian history because the response by the Prime Minister was to prorogue Parliament. This was a Parliament that started sitting on the 18th of November in 2008 and was prorogued on the 4th of December. It's unheard of, as far as I know, unheard of in, in, in um, Westminster parliamentary history that a session would be that short, ending in prorogation for no particular reason other than, in this instance, the Prime Minister attempting to avoid a, a, a confidence motion. He refused to face the House and test the confidence of the House. We have an expert in, in, in parliamentary government who will talk about what some of these things mean. But what happened was the Prime Minister was able to convince um, the Governor General to prorogue Parliament, preventing the, uh, um, the, the motion of confidence that would have defeated the Harper government and seen a Liberal NDP coalition government put into place. During the uh, month and a half or so that Parliament was prorogued, the uh, Prime Minister launched an attack on the coalition that was centered really around these claims. That it represented an undemocratic seizure of power. That it was an attempt to impose a government without the input from uh, the electorate. And that it represented uh, an unholy coalition with uh, the Bloc Québécois, with the separatist party. This was tremendously successful. By the time Parliament resumed at the end of the January, um, the Liberal leader, Stéphane Dion, who would have been Prime Minister had proper procedure been followed, had resigned as Liberal leader to be replaced spectacularly by Michael Ignatia. Um, and the notion of coalition had been discredited by the attack based on these pillars. The thing is, they're all lies. Every single one of those is untrue. Purely, simply, factually untrue. And what's, uh, what motivated me to, to do something like this was that the only way that could be successful is if most people don't actually understand the basis of their own democracy. And it strikes me that it's unconscionable for a department of political science facing an election not to do something, at least, to try and help people understand the democratic system in which they're being asked to participate. Um, there is nothing undemocratic, I'm sorry, about um, coalition government. I mean, since then, we've seen it operate um, in the United Kingdom, in the mother of the so-called so mother of Westminster Parliament. 
Um, there is nothing uh, about forming a government by coalition that does not have the same consent of the electorate. We do not elect a government. We don't elect prime ministers in this country. We elect a parliament, and parliament selects a government and a prime minister. And so if the parliament chooses uh, a coalition government led by Stefan Dion, that is just as legitimate an outcome as one uh, um, a minority uh, government of the conservatives under Stephen Harper on the, the 2008 return. And there's a difference between a coalition, a member of a coalition government, which is what the Liberals and the NDP put together, and uh, a party entering into an agreement with that government to provide supply for a period of time to allow them to govern, which is what the Bloc Québécois did. There was no coalition in that, in that instance with the Bloc Québécois. So each of these statements that was the basis of the attack on the coalition was simply untrue. But because we don't collectively understand our own system well enough, it was possible for the Prime Minister to stand up and build a case on the basis of really obvious lies and have that accepted. And as I said, I think as a, um, a Department of Political Science, it's, it's incumbent on us to try as far as possible to make sure that no future Prime Minister can lie at least about the nature of our government system and have that as widely accepted um, as this was. And in a moment, I'll, I'll turn the turn the mic over to my colleague Barbara Cameron, who will talk in more detail about that system and about what it means in the context of the present election. I just want to say a couple of things for those of you who are here about voting. Um, the polls are currently open here on campus, and any member of the university is able to go and vote in any riding in the country. So it doesn't have to be in, the, in, in this one. Uh, anywhere you live, you can vote in that uh, writing here in an advanced poll over in the Avita Center. Um, if you don't do that and need some further assistance in how to go about participating in the election, uh, this is a good place to start. The Elections Canada website provides um, information about how to vote and has a, a section particularly for students to help uh, them find out how to vote when they're away from home. Um, I'll turn this over now to, uh, to my colleague. Professor in the Department of Political Science with me, uh, Barbara Cameron, who is an expert in Canadian politics and government. Um, would you like me to do a little tech for you? Yes, and uh, I can take the mic too. Yes, yeah, so if you do that, <laughs> I'll switch. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, Professor Mudimer has set this up quite well for what I'm, uh, I have to say today. Uh, I have a few slides and I also uh, have a sheet uh, that outlines uh, possible scenarios, that uh, constitutional scenarios, what is possible constitutionally. I'm going to leave it up to you uh, at the end to think about this in terms of the current political context. So what I'm going to talk about is constitutionally uh, what is uh, possible. So based on what uh, Professor Mudimer said, this is a test. You might be able to tell me what's wrong with this statement that we have in the media frequently. On October 19th, Canadians will elect a new government. Does anybody know what is wrong with that statement? No takers? Guesses? What might be wrong with that statement? We don't, as Professor Mutimer said, we don't elect governments in Canada. We elect legislatures. So elections create legislatures. The elected legislatures create the government. So we have a, a two-step process. Uh, Sometimes they get merged together, um, but it is uh, a two-step 
a process. This isn't the United States where the president is directly elected. We do not, there's a small group of people in Calgary who get to vote for, uh, uh, got to vote for Stephen Harper in the last, uh, uh, last election. What's fundamental to this is the principle of responsible government, which is uh, uh, the basis of accountability within our democratic accountability of the executive uh, to the legislative branch. The government, which is the executive, the cabinet, is accountable to the people through the legislature, which was the formulation of Johnny MacDonald in the Confederation debates and uh, expresses that, uh, that relationship. So it's not too serious. We all, and I probably do this today, we all often say government when we might mean parliament or we might mean something the cabinet did, and, and that's kind of a shorthand that we all use. Uh, but, and it's not maybe too serious in the current context. When it does become serious is on election night when we have the media saying Canadians have just elected, fill in the blanks, as a minority government. Because when the media does that, it is taking away from the legislature the possibility of creating a government. They're no longer reporting they are uh, influencing and ruling out some really important uh, alternatives. So a colleague, Hugo Sear, who is a professor of uh, law at the uh, University of Quebec at Montreal, uh, has written a paper where he sees if there is a government elected, uh, a, a parliament elected without any party having a majority, uh, he's identified 12 different possibilities of what, what might happen. So it's not uh, inevitable in a situation where no party has a minority that uh, one leader or another is going to be uh, the prime minister. Uh, uh, so I'm going to go through some of what the uh, rules are uh, surrounding this. A lot of our confusion is that these rules are part of the unwritten constitution that we, uh, we inherited uh, from Britain. Uh, the British actually have started to write down some of these rules and, uh, and uh, that we haven't quite uh, done it. And it's governed by constitutional conventions. So here's the definition that comes from the uh, previous uh, uh, dean at, at Osgood, uh, Patrick Monaghan. Constitutional conventions are rules of political behavior that are regarded by political actors as binding on them, but are not enforced by the courts. So these are politically enforced rules that govern the behavior of political actors. And the Supreme Court, in a case having to do with uh, bringing uh, our Constitution to Canada, patriating our Constitution, uh, set out a three-part test to help the courts determine when there was a Constitution, so that when there was a convention. So the courts will not uh, legally enforce conventions, but they've said, well, they'll say whether or not one exists when they're, when they're asked to do that. So the three-part test is, what are the precedents? So what happened in the past? What did political actors in the, the past do? What do the actors believe they were bound to do by the rules? And is there a reason for the rules? Now, you might be able to spot a problem with these, uh, this test of the court. Did the actors believe they were bound by the rules? And as Professor Moodimer has pointed out, in 2008 and 2009, we had a prime minister 
uh, who was making the rules up as he went along to suit himself. So you have a problem in a situation where uh, the political actors uh, don't, uh, don't uh, believe they are, are bound, by the, uh, bound by the rules. So sometimes I find for students the difference between convention and law uh, is, um, is kind of abstract. So I'll give an example of when you might need a law and when a convention, an uh, un, unwritten uh, rule of the Constitution might uh, work. And this uh, goes back to the prorogation crisis of 2008 that Professor Mudumer talked about. And my example comes from, uh, from England, and there's two parts to this uh, example. The first part uh, is personal. It concerns my uh, English mother-in-law, uh, and who's very, follows politics, spends time in, in Canada. So we were talking to her about various things, and maybe to make conversation, we told her that our Prime Minister had just prorogued Parliament in order to avoid uh, a vote of non-confidence, to avoid being defeated in the House of Commons and replaced as Prime Minister. And she sort of gasped and said, that would never happen in Britain. And this kind of surprised me because my uh, mother-in-law was a dyed-in-the-wool supporter of the Labour Party. She's from a part of England, as my brother-in-law says, Labour could run a kangaroo here and, and the kangaroo would be elected. So her normal response would be, what can you expect from a bunch of Tories? That wasn't her response. Her response was, oh, that would never happen in England. So I have another example from another part of the social ladder in, in Britain, the British House of Lords. And the British House of Lords was hearing, um, was holding hearings on uh, their fixed term parliament act, which is like our uh, fixed date election act, except they've written it better. <laughs> And uh, there was in that act that this act limits the power of the Prime Minister to recommend to the Queen that uh, Parliament be dissolved for an election. So they put into that that it didn't affect the monarch's power to prorogue Parliament. And you know our Governor General is the equivalent of the monarch in, in our system. So there were hearings held and uh, by the Constitution Committee of the House of Lords on this bill, and they knew about the Canadian situation. And one of the Lords asked a leading constitutional expert in Britain, well, is it possible that something like happened in Canada around prorogation would happen in, in Britain? And Anthony Bradley, who is a leading constitutional expert in Britain, said, well, theoretically it's possible, but that would be a new low in British politics. And the House of Lords put that in their report, the committee put it in their report uh, to the Lords and said that we, we agree that there is little chance this will be abused. Uh, in the United Kingdom. So what we have here is two requirements for a convention to be politically enforced. You have to have an electorate who understands and believes that political actors ought to be bound by the rule, and you have political elites who think they ought to be bound. And if you don't have either of these things, uh, you, uh, you're, well, especially if you don't have an electorate, that's kind of the key in this, whether the, to, um, to having a convention, an unwritten rule, rather than something that is, has more teeth to it. So the question we have about Canada Whoops. 
We don't have a remote here, so that's why I keep wandering back and forth. The question in Canada is, do we have these requirements? And as Professor Moodmer pointed out, in 2009, it appeared that we didn't. We didn't have an electorate who understood what the conventions would be, and we clearly did not have political actors who thought they should be bound by the conventions. We also did not have an educated media. So the media, for those of us who knew something about what the conventions were, we were tearing our hair out listening to the uh, media because it was as if they were just taking the press releases from the Prime Minister's office. They, uh, and it wasn't until we got together a group of 50 or so constitutional experts to say, no, it would be completely legitimate for the Governor General to call on another leader to form a government. That the media started to say, oh, well, maybe there's some other side to this. So uh, there's uh, a, a, an issue, a problem in Canada. Now, I've noticed some change in this election in that the National Post had on its website a little uh, YouTube video uh, that did explain some of the conventions, and Peter Mansbrit was also on, on the National explaining that these things are not automatic <coughs> in a situation when you have a minority government. Okay, so it's a profoundly political question. There are constitutional precedents that can come into play. And so what I'm going to talk about now is what is constitutionally uh, possible when you are forming a government after an election. And the uh, real challenge is when you do not have a party that gains a majority of the seats, which is uh, sort of where uh, things may be going now. So there are really two rules and lots of possibilities around the rules. The first rule is that the incumbent government has the right to test the confidence of the House of Commons. So irrespective of the outcome of the election, the government currently in office can meet the House of Commons. Now there's a lot of politics that come into play around this. The background to this is that when Parliament is dissolved to make way for an election, the existing government continues in office. So this is why we have a government right now that can sign a a major trade agreement, but we don't have a sitting parliament right now. So after October 19th, the sitting government can, irrespective of the outcome, choose to meet parliament and test the confidence of the House. The second principle in keeping with uh, or convention in keeping with the principle of responsible government is a governor general appoints as prime minister the person who can command the confidence of the House of Commons. Now this is a grand word, command the House of Commons. What it means is that they won't defeat the prime minister. It doesn't have to be a positive sense. They can get up and yell at him all they want as long as they don't vote uh, to defeat them. Okay, so um, just a bit on the issue of the incumbent government. It's actually a huge advantage to be the incumbent government in certain situations because one of the con other conventions of the way our uh, Constitution works is the uh, Prime Minister advises the Governor General about when Parliament uh, should be summoned, which means when, when will they come back and meet 
and have the chance to vote one way or the other. And the only requirement we have about when a parliament meets after an election is that there can't be more than 12 months between one session of parliament and another session of parliament. So the last session of parliament ended at some point in June of this year. So theoretically, if the population were prepared to put up with it, a prime minister would not have to advise the governor general to summons parliament until sometime next June. Now, people, I hope, wouldn't put up with that. But nonetheless, it does give some room for an incumbent prime minister that doesn't have a majority of supporters in the House to do quite a bit of politicking and you know get together a throne speech, because it's after Parliament comes back, and you have a speech from the throne, and you then have a vote on that, that you know whether or not the Prime Minister. And so you can put all kinds of goodies in the, uh, in the, speech, from the speech from the throne. OK, so what I want to do is go through some scenarios about what's possible around the formation of a government after an election. So these are on the uh, sheet there. If you don't have one. So you know now that uh, it seems likely that we will not have a uh, one party win the majority of seats in the election. Um, polls are up and down. It's impossible to know what's going on. Things change so quickly. But it, it looks like we will not have one party with the, with the majority. But I'll start with majority. So if a party of the incumbent prime minister, which case would be the Conservative Party, wins a majority, there's, it's pretty obvious that would be, he would just, he or she would just continue as the prime minister. If a prime minister, if a party other than the party of the sitting prime minister, the incumbent prime minister, were to win the majority of, of seats, then the likely scenario is that the existing prime minister would resign to make way for the governor general to ask the leader of the party that had the majority of the seats to form the government. The only case I can think of where that wouldn't happen would be if there were some completely unusual situation that there was a big split in that party in the in the election, um, in which case, you know, we might have a different situation, but in general, that's that's the way it would uh, it would work. But the interesting cases are when we have no party that wins a majority in the House of Commons, and we have those are uh, plurality situations. So generally, I have an example of a tie at the end, or a case of a scenario of a, of a tie. But generally one party wins more seats than other parties. So I've got several uh, options here. An incumbent government, so in this case it would be the conservative government, they could win the most seats, but not a majority. Okay, so what, what would happen in that situation? Well, it's already a sitting government. They could continue in office. They could uh, offer their uh, throne speech and hope to be sustained in, in office. They would also have the option of coming to an agreement <coughs> with another party if they wanted to. Now, it's not clear in our current situation who the Conservatives would form an agreement with, but it's conceivable that a party might be in that situation. They could even 
form a coalition. These are all constitutionally possible options. But what has happened in the past in Canada is government would, uh, would continue. The second scenario where a government, sitting government, wins the a plurality of seats, but not a majority, and the opposition parties get together and come to an agreement that that sitting government should be defeated and a leader of one of the opposition parties should become the prime minister. And that's what happened in Ontario in 1985. So the sitting premier, it was a conservative, won, the party won more seats than either the Liberals or the NDP. The uh, leader, Frank Miller, met the legislature and was defeated in the legislature. The lieutenant governor, the equivalent provincially of the governor general, called on David Peterson, who was the uh, liberal leader, to be the premier. Now, Frank Miller's view was that he was entitled to have the, the lieutenant governor dissolve the legislature so there could be another election and he could get another kick at the can. And uh, the lieutenant governor said, no, there's another government here that is uh, in waiting. So I'm going to call on, on, on that uh, person. So in that situation, the sitting prime minister or, or premier can meet the legislature, but given that we have something of a precedent that they're not going to get a, a, a dissolution of, of the legislature so there can be an election, they would be disinclined to uh, can I uh, ask do that. Did Miller actually ask the Lieutenant government to call a new election after his um, did? I, and that, that was refused. I don't know if that just happened through the media or if he actually... I think he actually asked the Yeah, I, 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 I don't know that for sure. I don't know that for sure. It was certainly his stated view and then quite possibly, or maybe the lieutenant governor said, you know, don't be silly. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. But, but that is a, that's an interesting point. So, um, my next uh, plurality situation what happens if another party wins a plurality? And this has actually come up in some of the discussion around the election, where the leaders have been asked, what do you think should happen in a situation where a party has a plurality? And some of the leaders have said, uh, well, the person who gets the most seats should automatically become the, the Prime Minister, but that's not, uh, in fact, what the conventions say. So in that situation, say the NDP or the Liberals end up with more seats, but not the majority of, of seats, the Prime Minister, under this first convention, could meet could meet the House and could test the confidence of the House. Now there's some debate on this point, but that's uh, what the uh, historic convention is uh, around that. And in that situation, could simply take his chances with his throne speech or her throne speech, uh, or could try to cobble together an agreement, or could uh, attempt to form a coalition. What a coalition is, is you actually have members of the other party in your cabinet, whereas the usual situation in Canada has been that uh, you, uh, other parties, uh, you, you get, try and get your support from different, uh, different parties. So 
that would be a possibility. Another possibility would be that the Prime Minister resigns, which is what Paul Martin did in 2006. In that case, and this is really where I think there is the, uh, some of the uh, debate uh, today, does the Governor General in that situation immediately call on the leader of the party that has the most seats? Nobody has a majority. The Governor General is left without a Prime Minister to advise him or her and needs, needs that. That's uh, basic to our uh, situation. My view about on this is that the Governor General should stand back and wait for the parties to try and uh, work it out. Because otherwise, the Governor General is usurping the role of the legislature to create a government. So there's a democratic argument for that, but also there's an argument around the stability of government. That if the parties can somehow come to an agreement, and we now have some uh, precedents, Ontario, the UK, around this, then the, um, it's better for the Governor General to say, okay, you know, you work it out, I would like to have as stable a government as possible. And if it's not possible to work it out, uh, then the Governor General would have to be, uh, have to be involved. <coughs> the basic point here is it's not the number of seats. It's which leader is capable of maintaining the confidence of the House of Commons. That is the basic point about the way our, our system works. So my final and probably very unlikely scenario is if uh, two parties tie. So there's a tie. They get the same seats, number of seats. So what? should happen in that situation, and it seems obvious to me in that situation that the Governor General should tell them to work it out and end up going with the, uh, go, going with the uh, decision of, of the parties. And, in, and this is pretty accepted in other Westminster systems that the political process is desirable. You don't want to involve, in Britain, they don't want to involve the Queen for sure, because there's quite, you know, there is an, an anti-monarchist tradition in Britain. If you read The Guardian, you'll know that uh, there is a Republican uh, sentiment. They don't want to get the Queen involved in uh, political issues, and that was one of the criticisms in uh, 2008 and 2009 that our Prime Minister should not have put the Governor General in the position that she was put in, because you don't want that, that, that to happen. Okay. Okay, just a, one final point about the incumbent government, and this is a point that Hugo Sears makes. If an incumbent government resigns, and then there's negotiations among the parties. Nothing uh, excludes that party that has resigned, the one that was in office, from being part of whatever the other arrangement is. It's the same principle, the same idea behind this. It is whatever arrangement uh, will gain the confidence uh, of the House. So my last. Uh, point that I want to make is to suggest that we really need to take these issues, these matters, out of the control of constitutional experts. In a democratic society, you should not have to know all the precedents, everything that went before, 
it should be a transparent process where people know what's going on. And countries do this. Germany's got it well set out in its constitution. So there's quite a bit of uh, push now among uh, political scientists in Canada to get some of this set out in a clearer form. And one idea is something called the Cabinet Manual, which they have in, uh, first of all, in New Zealand and, and in the UK. So you write down, you get people together, you write down the rules to figure out what they should be, and then there's something that, that people can uh, refer to. Uh, there could be legislation. We could amend the Parliament of Canada's Act, which recently was done for some uh, proposals that a conservative backbencher, Michael um, Chong, proposed. And there could be some uh, changes to the procedures of the House of Commons, which just takes a vote of the members of the House of Commons. So uh, we uh, hopefully will see, uh, in Britain they were very sensible when the Labour Party realized it wasn't going to get another majority. It sat down with people and uh, worked with constitutional experts to get some kind of a, uh, an agreement working. Now I have my own little, uh, I'm in favor of all of this. I think quite a simple change would be to have something called an investiture vote. And this could go along with the provision which uh, Peter Russell has been promoting that you have some limitation put on uh, how long a prime minister can wait before advising the governor general to summon his parliament. An investiture vote would, instead of waiting for the speech from the throne and allowing the incumbent government to put out all kinds of goodies that you know made it look like it was all things to all people, you would have a vote in the uh, legislature on who ought to be the person uh, to form uh, the government. It could take the, it would take the form of a, uh, an indication, a signal to the governor general about who would have the confidence uh, of the House of Commons. And I think that uh, would also help Canadians get a clearer idea of the role of the elected legislature in the, um, in the uh, formation of a, of a government and keeping a government in office. So I will leave this now open to you to speculate what might happen after October 19th. And uh, any speculation is as good as any other because uh, none of us know what's going to happen. Uh, okay, we'll uh, enter into a, a, a Q&A period. Let me just, before people uh, have to scatter the classes and so on, remind any students who've arrived, please sign in in the uh, register at the back of the room. Uh, please vote. Uh, and for those who are interested, uh, we are planning here in this room on election night to uh, gather a group of people to watch the returns together. So if any of you would rather do that in company rather than uh, in the isolation of your own uh, apartment or home, please feel welcome to, to come here uh, on the 19th. Uh, now, yes, you have a question and then Dave. Oh, um, I have a problem with the British Constitution, an unwritten Constitution, with convention. The thing is that there is no real tradition to fully maintain within the system. It's something that evolves and adapts as, as it goes along when you don't have a written constitution. Now, one proposal I made some time ago to look at where the British parliamentary system has been transferred to the older Commonwealth, Australia, New Zealand, and the new Commonwealth countries, which, by the way, is a havoc there because there's no tradition in terms of what should be done. And if that does not actually take place, it then becomes chaos because the so-called government of gentlemen <laughs> doesn't basically operate. So it seems to me that what we're getting under the way Harper actually played that game. And one of the issues that it raised 
is how well informed the governor general is about government. And, and that's another thing, who he appoints as a governor general and whether or not he's well informed. There's no more Eugene Forsey in Canada. <laughs> if Eugene Forsey was here, by the way, he would speak and it would become basically law. So it seems to me that it's a trial and error thing. And I don't know how anybody can really fully say what should really happen. One example I'd use, when the Queen appointed Lord Hume in Britain to become Prime Minister, Butler was head of the party, the, the Conservative Party. She sidestepped the head of the party. Now the reason for that is the British Constitution does not recognize political parties because it existed prior to political party conventions. And it's only since we start having conventions, you can then say you know exactly who is the leader of the party. So if you don't solve that problem, then there is a crisis in, in that regard. So do you see any of these uh, proposals at the end being helpful? I mean, I think you're correct to refer to, I mean, it is, we've inherited from a period in which there were sort of gentlemen's agreements around these things. and. Uh, you know, if you don't even know what the agreement is. Um, but it predates uh, a mass democratic society for, uh, for sure. Uh, our constitution also doesn't recognize um, parties or doesn't mention the prime minister or... Uh, it, it mentions the prime minister once. Okay. <laughs> uh, in in a, a little obscure clause at the end, that says the prime minister must consult with Aboriginal people. Oh yes, okay. Yes. That's the only yeah. reference to the prime minister in the constitution. So, but anyway, I, I asked you a question about what would you see as a solution to it. I, I think, uh, and again, oh, there's one other problem, and I will just throw that in, and perhaps it might go on later on. The other difficulty, accountability, in our parliamentary system, the accountability is real crisis because Parliament has lost its control over the system. We have adopted prime ministerial government, which is almost like presidential government. And cabinet members are not strong enough anymore to stand up to the prime minister. In the past, cabinet ministers did that. And in fact, ultimately, they resigned if they didn't like what's going on. That has gone out through the window. So it's a much broader issue that the system of government has really gone as a problem. Some of the work I'm doing right now is to basically argue that there's a, an accountability crisis in a government. That's what even the parliamentary budget officer is basically coming up with. Because you start having omnibus bills, you push these things through. And by the way, the press takes the view the prime minister is God. You know, nobody questions under this kind of a system. I, I agree with you on all those points. Maybe we could just fix this right now. Yeah. <laughs> we could fix this. <laughs> but I, I agree. I mean, there's the electoral system. We have lots of issues in it. I think there was a question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, it was totally off the general line of topic. I was just going to ask David if for the election night, you and McLaughlin was going to provide nerf bricks and bats to throw the people <laughs> <laughs> No, we'll provide popcorn and potato chips, but I uh, hope people experience. don't throw them. <laughs> uh, uh, let me play devil's advocate of both of you. Yes. I think uh, there is a very strong case to be made that in the in terms of prorogation or even calling uh, 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 parties, that there's a lot of confusion and things are not well understood. Uh, to add to your point about uh, the British Queen, she, she has publicly complained, I believe, that she didn't know who to call in that circumstances on who should be Prime Minister or ask the former government. Her father had this big conundrum when Chamberlain was resigned, did he call on Churchill or Halifax? He didn't know. And it wasn't help when he asked Churchill for advice that he kept him up. The, I think the key thing is here, who is the Governor General. And you have to have some sympathy with the Governor General because the case that I'm surprised neither of you mentioned was the King Bing dispute in 1926. In that case, there was a minority liberal government 
they were defeated, uh, Mackenzie King went to the Prime Minister and said, can you call an election? And since the election had been relatively recently held, the Governor General said no. The Conservative leader Mann was called on to form a government. It ended up being very short-lived. In the resulting election, Mackenzie King vilified this Governor General and was returned to with the majority. So the lesson that probably the Governor General Mikhail John had a few years ago is she looked at that King Bing dispute and she thought, if I counter the advice of a prime minister and there's an election, I'm going to be vilified and I could end up in the same situation. So maybe you'd like to comment on that. Um, King didn't get a majority in 26. Uh, in the subsequent election, he did. In, no, 20, the, in the one after. Oh, one after. But yes. even in 26, which was the election won, won on the issue, he actually got less popular support than the Conservatives did in that election. But because he got more seats. Um, but, but I agree with you that it, it is a, you know, it's a hugely important, and it was thought around the prorogation uh, crisis that, uh, that that was a consideration. Uh, one of the things that has come up is that uh, our Governor General, and I think this goes to a point that you were making, um, doesn't really have a permanent body, I think there's one person or something, uh, to advise uh, her, him, uh, on constitutional issues and is actually dependent on the Privy Council office, which is part of the centralization of power that's been going on, is now considered the Department of the Prime Minister. So, uh, and the Governor General can consult whomever um, he or she wants and did. I mean, it was Peter Russell and Peter Hogg and all the usual suspects were, were consulted uh, on it. But, but there was no kind of countervailing uh, authority uh, there for the, uh, for the Governor General. What about the Privy Council? They, they, they extend that. By the way, all previous members of Privy Council uh, are really Privy Councillors. It's just that by convention, they don't meet. So couldn't there not be a body like a country to which a, which one, so-called wise men, <laughs> the privy councillors, who could have a say in this sort of thing, which would take some of this out of the hands of just the prime minister? Yeah, I, I, I want to put it in the hands of the elected legislature as much as we, uh, as much as we possibly can. I think that only in, uh, Really, you know, really unusual situations should the governor general be be called on uh, and, and that's, to interview. I mean, that seems to me to be the answer to, uh, to, to this question. But in in two ways. One, to go back to something you said earlier, the prime minister should never put the governor general in that position. They should never have requested prorogation. He should have been willing to test it, the, the confidence of the house, and if he loses, he loses. Um, once she's put in that position, though, it seemed to me that it was very clear that there was a government in waiting in place that had the confidence of the House. Had every indication that that was true, um, given that she had a letter signed by a significant majority of the members of the House of Commons saying that they supported a co the, the coalition government. Um, it, given that, and given how recently the um, the election had been, the obvious thing was to allow the uh, allow Parliament to make its own decisions, which would have been a motion of, of confidence against the sitting government, and if it had lost, called on the leader of the coalition to test its confidence. If both of those motions had failed, then you call um, another election, but you allow the two obvious choices that can demonstrate some reason for them to believe that they have the command of confidence of the House to test it. The thing with King Bing, there's no reason for the Governor General in that instance to think that the Conservatives could have commanded a majority of the House. So there was, they had no reason to believe that whatsoever. And it was proven to be right. They, they didn't. I think, though, that King resigned, didn't he? Yeah, But once he had resigned, the Governor General needed a Prime Minister. I think this is, I, 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 I'm pretty sure Forsey makes this point, that 
So, because you can't leave the governor general with nobody, mm. even if it's somebody who doesn't have the, I mean, if a, if, if a governor general grants dissolution after a government's defeated, the defeated government still stays in office because the governor general needs somebody to, to advise, uh, advise him. But I think, I agree, I think it's a really shaky. Well, if the precedent is that the governor general in that situation where a prime minister faces a vote of confidence uh, isn't going to give a dissolution. That's the precedent. Uh, but there is there are debates in political science, and there's also real debates about prorogation. This volume co-edited by uh, Peter Russell and, and Lawrence Austin, there's a lot of debate in there about you know what should have happened in, uh, in 2008. One thing uh, Lawrence Austin, who's the dean at Osgood, has argued is at least the governor general should publish the reason yeah. for the decision, <laughs> so we have some idea of what's uh, yeah. what's going on with it. Okay. I'm wondering if we're just overthinking this a little bit. The essence of the title of our executive prime minister, the primary minister. Governor General wants. The Prime Minister is the Governor General's only political advisor. And every day the Governor General has a choice. Do I keep the Prime Minister or do I sack the Prime Minister? And the only thing the Governor General needs to think about when making that choice is does the Prime Minister still command the confidence of the House? Yes or no? If they do, then the Governor General has to take the Prime Minister's advice, whatever that advice is. If they don't, the Governor General has to ask for the Prime Minister's resignation. So how does how does that work in 2008? When the Michelle Prime John did the right thing. When the Prime Minister... <coughs> Michelle John did the absolute right thing. The prime, she has two choices. Do I accept Harper's advice or do I sack him right here and ask for his resignation? Not do I sack, do I send him back to the house? Why not? Because, because that's not the choice. The choice is do I accept his advice or do I take his resignation? That's, why why couldn't that and, and again, the, 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 the thing is, his advice was correlation. If that coalition really was hell bent to have his head, six weeks wouldn't have mattered. Mm -hmm. But okay. she correctly saw that that coalition was like the case with you know me and in the twenties, and and she wasn't going to sack a prime minister over. You know the reality was they couldn't even organize a coup. How were they going to organize it? You know, they left I know, but is that the job Bush. of the prime minister? Is that the job of the governor general? Well, the governor, the, like I said, the governor general has two choices: take the prime minister's <laughs> advice. The prime minister asks for prorogation. Mm -hmm. If you don't take the prime minister's advice, if you cannot accept the prime minister's advice, they are no longer your primary advisor, and you got to take their resignation. Well, it would have been. It would and have been. at that point, who would be the government? That the, the, the confidence had not been withdrawn by the House yet. You know, the, the reality is the people who organized that coalition attempt in 2008 didn't do their politics right. Oh, yeah, there's, there's no, no question, question about you know, that. But you're, so your argument. Harper, and they left Harper to stay. And, well, and she did the right thing. She continued to take her prime minister's advice. I don't think Adrian Clarkson. I've heard her at conferences where she Well, well no, but that, but, that is, but that is our constitutional history. No, but, so they're but we had... Prime minister or they're not your it's prime an minister. issue of what constitutes confidence. I agree that it was, uh, it was a very confused well, situation, but by your argument, in 1926, the Governor General should have given King a dissolution of Parliament to avoid a vote or of take his resignation, the governor general chose to take his resignation. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, what would happen is the governor general takes a decision, and then the prime minister decides 
whether the only time a governor general would dismiss a prime minister is in extraordinarily unusual circumstances. The governor general would take a position, an opinion, would make a decision, then the prime minister would have to decide, yeah, do and, I and, resign? And, 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 and that's what Harper would have done. If he, you know, if he said, no, I can't let you parole. Okay. Yeah. Then he can he, resign. That's fine. And then but, they, but the thing was, but that she chose, but that's the choice the governor general has. Mm -hmm. Take the prime minister's advice or take the government or take the prime minister's resignation. But, but I believe and that. that's no, what protects no, but yeah, that's what protects the democratic but, 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 accountability no. of the parliament. I think something in the British Constitution that has to be the royal prerogative is not a clearly stated thing. It's still something that is evolving. So even governor generals and people like that, you cannot really say what the person do. Check what has happened in Australia, Whitlam, in situations like that. You have had cases where by the way the governor has fired the prime minister. And again, technically, that's an element of the royal prerogative. Which is still really not, but, but, not but, clear. But, but it's that either or. It's that insistence on an either or. You either take the Prime Minister's advice or you take the Prime Minister's resignation that protects the democracy. So where's the principle that you have? Is the principle that the Governor General uh, accepts the advice of a Prime Minister who has the confidence of the House? Or the Governor General can decide, I'll take his advice or I won't take his advice. No, 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 no. You can't. The, the, thing, the only rule the Governor General is allowed to use in making that decision is does the Prime Minister presently at this moment in time have the confidence of the House of Commons? And so the fact she got letters from each of the leaders of the opposition. What, yeah, what you're she, saying and, is and, it and, had and, to be in the House and, even... And, and, and at the exact same time, there were also news reports saying that half the Liberal caucus mm -hmm. wanted a new leader because they didn't agree to even a gift signing. At exactly, at exact Fionn sign, at exactly yeah, it was, that very same moment. It was a very confused situation. So, so. so the old, and, and the bright red line for whether or not the Prime Minister has confidence or not is a vote of non-confidence in the House of Commons. Exactly, which was scheduled for several days yeah, later. But, but, so but the answer is, is but, but they find out. out. But they, they, the, the idiots yeah, they should, Of course, I, no, no question. No question. They should simply have held the, the and so, and so they And so the Governor General gave, gave Harper his six weeks. And if they were still determined to vote non-confidence, they could have voted. Mm -hmm. But they weren't. She was right that she, she was absolutely right. Harper still had the confidence of the House, so she took his advice. Okay, we get back to a point raised earlier about the kind of control of the executive branch of the legislature, so the control of the agenda of the legislature that allowed the Prime Minister to reschedule uh, that vote. So uh, there, there were a lot of, I mean, it was, it, it was a complicated situation in 2008. By the way, you know the situa another situation is interesting. When Trudeau had resigned and he had a Liberal Party and McKechnie brought down the government. Oh, yeah. And here's a situation too where the party didn't have a leader and they <laughs> literally asked the previous leader to come back and run the election. And all I'm arguing here, there are a lot of things in the British system that are still basically unwritten and unclear. And if you don't have a system evolved, I guess that's the other point I was going to make, that it's a system that is evolutionary, that the conventions go on and you adapt as you go along, and without some time evolving, and by the way, that explains Canada, New Zealand, and those countries, vis-a-vis -vis the new Commonwealth countries, which they have no tradition about there, and basically have destroyed that system. It doesn't operate in principle. And that's one of the critical things that Canada is reaching a stage now where that has to be addressed. So, yeah, it seems like all these opinions have been expressed in the debates and they uh, shows that we do need a process to kind of come to some kind of resolution.
wondering about the election system. So, is right now it's whoever gets the most votes, not the majority of the votes in their writing. And I've seen, I think it was in the last election that Stephen Harper himself didn't get the majority. So it's people calling strategic voting. But then there's, uh, so I saw in an interview with Elizabeth May, she said <coughs> if there's a minority parliament, she'd uh, stand with the party in, if uh, they agree to pass something about uh, proportional representation voting. But then there's other places, uh, they're saying that here in the city, and uh, they want to try the ranking system. If it works, they'll take it to provincial. And I'm, I'm a bit confused about the different voting systems, proportional representation, ranking, and. Yeah, it's a, it, that is another big democratic. Uh, yeah. right, and that issue. was the theme of last <laughs> week's panel um, <laughs> in this series. Uh, so when it goes up on the website, have a look at uh, of that discussion. But the, I mean, the, the, one of the problems that we face with trying to get any form of electoral reform is the, the, the first past the post system um, is tremendously beneficial to the party that's in power. They're able to retain power without having to command a majority of the votes. And so what you see time and time again is um, the government uh, to get into power making promises around electoral reform that they've been back away from. I mean, the, um, the, the conservatives in the coalition government in Britain is the most, the most recent and uh, remarkable example where the, the principal ag agreement with the Liberal Democrats was to um, uh, electoral reform. They brought in a, a referendum on electoral reform and then the conservatives campaigned vigorously against it. Um, <coughs> And again, yes, the, there's, there was, you know, it was, it was terrible politics on the part of the Liberal Democrats, um, but it's, it's a very consistent pattern that sitting governments recognize they have no real interest in, in altering the system that put them into power. The Liberals in Ontario brought in a, um, an electoral reform um, a referendum that, again, they I don't know that they actively campaigned against it, but my word, they didn't campaign tremendously vigorously for it, and they made it virtually impossible to understand what it was that was being proposed. So it's a very difficult um, problem to overcome. But you know, part of the discussion that is going on here is democracy. Democracy is a range of institutional characteristics. It's not just voting. And, and, and I think when we get into this year, proportional representative, what you're really getting at is the complexity of democracy. It's not something that is just linked to voting. The institutional arrangement, and by the way, the British Constitution they still talk about the, 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 the Lord, you know, spiritual and temporal and all those kind of stuff. And it has representation in the House of Lords from all sectors of society. And just like how we're even here debating, I mean, an elected Senate, same kind of complexities come up because it's not intended just, just to be treated yeah. simply because if you have another elected Senate, then it's just replicating what is already in the House of Commons. So I think what we really need here is a much deeper discussion of contemporary democracies in terms of what it really means, uh, apart from just the electoral process. Uh, our time has, uh, has pretty much exhausted and uh, and people are beginning to uh, dwindle, if that's the right verb in my country. So let me draw things officially to a close. I want to uh, express our appreciation tangibly to, to Barbara by giving her the most coveted item at York University. <laughs> the only way you can get one of these is by giving a talk at McLaughlin oh, College. Oh, thank you. So,